one of the most powerful things I can remember. My life has been being an experience of coming to know why am I here and coming to know that that me or that my or that mine or that I, why am I here, is much bigger than what I thought is here. That's what today is about. It's about that figure, that's something more um, that William James talked about. We think we know, um, but when we think we know, um, that's a good sign that we ought to step back pause, recollect, re-embrace the possibility that there's something we don't know and that the I that thinks they know is an I that's in a flow, in a process of becoming and that is even manifesting something that is more. Thank you. William James, the great philosopher of 19th century I've been I've been reading about lately and I've been writing a book uh, on the fear problematique and it's an approach to educational philosophy for the 21st century. It's really a summary of about 30 plus years of my work uh, since beginning the In Search of Fearlessness project and I'm going to read a couple of pages from chapter five today as an excerpt um, to entertain you and or to motivate you at the most into an inspirational life of continually asking, why am I here? And for me, I think I really zoomed in on that question, why am I here, through my inquiry into the nature and role of fear. And fear, I put marks on like that because even fear, I would argue, is not something that we can know or pin down, put in a box and make all pretty and put it in a nice self-help book to say, here are the steps of how to deal with fear and manage fear and conquer fear and be great. And whoever you're going to be, be yourself because you're not controlled by fear. Well, all of that, I put a big bracket around, a big balloon around and say, with a pin, I could pop that in two seconds because after 33 years, basically of following this path of fearlessness in the search and the quest to know and better understand the nature and role of fear in the human experiencing and beyond human experiencing, I have basically come to say, we don't really know as much about fear as we think we do. Uh, so that'll come out a little bit in my reading. Uh, the chapter five is called Fear Management Education uh, for the 21st century. And the subtitle is Fear Meets Education, a Massive Confusion. So I'm talking also as an educator, but before I go into that part of myself, which is my scholarly, academic, educator, PhD part of myself, uh, one of the reasons I'm presenting myself here today and why I've taken some time to think about being with you today in this video is really that I, I had a powerful experience. Uh, I've shared it before, I think, in a few videos at different points. But that's not so much important as that transformative event in late 1989 with a partner at the time for this vision. But what's really was important was how would I manifest in that vision, this being, this body, this piece of flesh, where would I come into this vision and how would that manifest in the world? So I'm sitting here 33 later years later telling you it's a journey and it's not straightforward and there's confusions there's massive confusions there's terrors there's all kinds of things as well as the joy and the excitement of living a very alive and risky life welcome to the show today not really a show it's our michael fisher doing his thing whoever he is what happened in 1989 after I had had that mystical experience with this partner, I attended a workshop um, that just happened to show up, right? Somebody rings me up and says, Mike, you, know, you really need to go to this. And my name was Robert. Um, final elimination of fear. And it was put on by a group out of, I believe, Southern Arizona on the West Coast. And they were 
promoting that they would do this workshop and by the time you leave you would be or be in a state or a condition in which you no longer would have to live in fear and that you could spread that energy that virus if you will the good virus uh, across the planet and i just couldn't believe that anyone would put this on and then when they said oh and this is put on by telstar and i went oh telstar what's telstar well then it says you know it stands for something which they did not give it was like a secret and it turns out that as they give more in the description on the brochure this is 1990 january it said um, this is going to be done by a process of channeling which is a spiritual connection through a body of a person named saratoga a she apparently in appearance who had walked out of her body and these entities from telstar who is this greater galactic intelligence out there somewhere apparently would be channeling through her to help teach us humans those of us in the room and of course we also are spiritual beings arguably but in this particular manifestation on earth physical um we would have some kind of interaction for as long as it takes that's what it says at the bottom as long as it takes it probably could take a day or two and they didn't say for sure but we were in this space and we they had rented and hotel downtown and we were going to have this experience with these entities coming and channeling through this body of this person saratoga uh, who was a very beautiful bodied being and had these wonderful characters come through the reason i say characters in the sense that that's why when i say why am i here i say why are my characters here today who's showing up today and today i'm going to show up in the character of the intellectual scholar in many of my videos i have over 110 now that you can watch on my channel here <clears throat> you'll see that there's there's many portrayals and possibilities and dramas and lectures that i give um, so point being any one of my videos is not who i am and it's not what i teach um, they are facets on the multi faceted crystal you might say of trying to access some forms of truth, some forms of wisdom, some forms of what might actually be practical and useful in this world and the challenges that we have. I don't need to repeat what all those crises and challenges are on the global scale, but we are in it deep and I am in there with you. And these spiritual forces came to me on that 1990 day uh, in January. We were there for 16 hours straight as it turned out. It was very transformative for me and my partner at that time. And uh, that is a, a huge story. I, one day I will write a book on that transformative experience that I had with her. Uh, she long since left the In Search of Freelessness project that I had first with her before that actual process workshop with Saratoga. So there's a little historical understanding, a little bit of connection to why I'm here. I'm obviously here for the In Search of Fearlessness movement, which I now call it. And that is a movement that is not mine. It is a movement that has been, I would argue, on this planet ever since fear appeared, so then did fearlessness. And that movement is there whether we see it or not, and it's mostly invisible to us now today for the most part. It expresses itself as a fearlessness movement in many forms, but it's basically a type of system cosmic self organismic re regulation, a resetting of the template away from a fear based life to a path of fearlessness onto a love based life, is another way to put it. Is different people have tried to describe this as I've in my studies, I've found out love and fear contrast dialectic sometimes opposition um, writing for a long time going back to the ancient documents all the way back to the Bhagavad Gita for example one of the oldest religious texts that we have today from India and Hinduism at the base that said uh, as you probably know I am not particularly a religious person I am atheistic in the sense of 
agnostical about whether there are particular God being or beings, angels, etc. But I do know that I have had experiences, as did you know, others who have not always expected or believed in spirits. I have had these encounters of, let's just call it the greater kind, the more than uh, one expects. And those are both beautiful and amazing and have been quite fruitful in my life and allowed me to not just be this Robert Michael Fisher or Bobby Fisher, as my mom would call me in the younger days, uh, that I can be these multiplicities of protein-like beings that I can play through and in and out play through me. Um, who knows who's in charge all the time anyway. But that's uh, what I'm here today is to read mostly from my architect, intellectual scholar, a little bit of the old wise man sitting in the basement in their library. That was my very first tarot card reading. I was in my early 30s and somebody was reading tarot cards in this retreat. It was a ski trip, um, cross country ski trip. And uh, somebody said, do you want to re get your card read? And I, oh, I'm not really into that, but oh, okay, sure. Maybe it'll be fun. Uh, anyway, the card they picked for what was to look at your sort of future and who, what archetypal being or pattern would likely be part of your life. The one that came to me, as I remember, was the magician in that particular card. It was this old scholarly man inside, down in a basement below the church, the sacred buildings, doing the scholarly work. So again, you'll notice I've talked about my artist self, I've talked about my educator self, I've talked about my intellectual selves in these 110 videos or so I have. Um, you'll see all parts. So today I'm going to go into this reading um, just because it's a sneak preview. So a little bit about the book. It is my 10th book, I believe, published full book. I've written many books that mostly not published or lots of half books or quarter books sitting in files and boxes piled up, um, probably never will get published. But this one is going to get published. Uh, Information Age Publishing is going to publish it. Um, I'm very pleased about that. And it's in an educational philosophy series um, through uh, Information Age Publishing. And the actual book title is The Fear Problematique. And it's really the subtitle still working on it is, you know, um, basically, what is the role of the educational philosopher in speaking truths to powers in a culture of fear? Well, if you just take those words in what I just said and those concepts, that's a lot about me and my scholarship. Um, and it's one that's been building, as I say, since late 1989. Uh, I was a school teacher early in my 80s. And so I went to into all of the educational world, so to speak, um, and saw what really needed to happen that wasn't happening. And that's been a long journey for me. So this book is my first out of all those 10 I books I've written the first real right on straight up, if there's such a thing, a uh, book on education and philosophy. Uh, very excited to share that with the world. And I feel like it will be a legacy publication for me. Without further ado, sit back and enjoy yourself. You can close your eyes if you will. I'll read a couple of pages from chapter five, Fear Management Education for the 21st Century. Fear meets education, colon, a massive confusion. Fear is not the first feature of educational experience associated with the progressive educational theorists. How does fear function in the processes of learning and growth? That was a question asked by scholars English and Stengel in 2010, two educational philosophers I've been reading quite a bit about. They wrote a really great article on exploring fear, looking at Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Dewey and Paulo Freire and comparing their understanding of fear in relation to learning. Now to my writing. As the fear problematique has been taking shape conceptually so far in this book, one of the main strategies of renewing our ways of imagining fear 
generally has been to locate fear more than try to define it under the typical what is fear questioning frame. Although such a means is not ignored, it is replaced with efforts to shift paradigmatic frames and attempt to bring new discussions forward afresh about fear and its nature and role. Already, the emphasis has been on seeing the philosophical and literary turn as a place to locate fear. For example, Bogan's phobial turn, that's her word, as well, there has been situating fear is social, which I will return to time and time again in this chapter to those and those that follow. Arguably in the political cultural sphere of knowing fear, one has to include the fact that a great arising interest to identify, name and research, culture of fear and fear mongering, et cetera. These all lead to fear is no longer merely an individual species. Strategically, situating fear within the affective turn and the era of discourse about emotions and feelings has also been a critical realignment to undermine the hegemonic discourses of reason and rationalism, capital R, as the Western Enlightenment hangover, which believes it can best understand everything from that perspective on knowledge and knowing. This book's underlying philosophy is not anti-rationalist, but integralist. The search is for a new wholeness and integrity to our knowledges and methodologies in and around the topic fear. It is synthetic and eclectic, but much more than that. Because of my own critical intercalist lens, demands and discernments and creativity and critical self-reflectivity that are rarely found in methodological approaches, this book will be different. The other strategies of replacement and relocating are implied. Fear is power, for example, and align the phenomenon of fear slash fear, sorry, knowledge slash fear slash power as a conceptual, ontological, and epistemological vector for human activities and history, along with the overlapping dynamics of fearism and philosophy of fear. All have been essential means of expanding the current individual, disciplinary, and collective fear imaginary. Psychologism of fear and its studies has been challenged within this fear working I am proposing. A new scholarship on fear and fear, as well as fear studies has been proposed. The application of a fearlessness paradigm to all things processes about fear is yet to come in chapter six. My point is there has been no shortage of ways for, to turn our lenses and perspectives and worldviews and open ourselves to transformative, even transdisciplinary encounters, which what we have typically and overly simply, simply called fear. Within the sphere, fear of education, which chapter five pivots around, is where things get really interesting and where the philosophers of education ought to give due attention. The critique all along, in this book is that philosophy of education is far behind the movements and the turns and appearances of fear and fear and the problematic of fear. At stake in this missing the boat, as I call it, the missing the truth is a deadly combination of philosophy of education steering or trying to away the wayward thing called education today. The case I'm making, the blind leading the blind somewhat is appropriate. That said, there are bright lights and openings of eyes here and there in the field of philosophy, education, and philosophy of education. Some mentioned and below, I will introduce some new allies. For this emancipatory mission essential to learning and the ex educative experience. Subheading fear dash and dash education. After my art space doctoral studies, of fear and education with focus on the culture of fear and fearless leadership, I began to think of how to summarize multiple ways to report on the relationship of fear and education. Due to limitations as a researcher and without funding in, in a position as a professor in the system, I began my own series of reports from the education literature on the status of what I would call fear education. The term here is meant to be ambivalent in meaning and even offensive to some, especially liberal types, who do not like to have their blessed education, virtuous ideals stained with the negative sounding, if not oppressive, 
leading word associated with it, that is fear. In my simple first critical review of the literature, of the literature, began with going through my quote files and library of articles I had collected for many years on fear specifically. I went at random through the hundreds of documents of where fear was written and published on as an subjective factor in the field of education. That postdoc paper that I published independently in 2003 set the stage for an actual methodology to meta-assess the entire field of relations of fear in education. And two years before that, I set out to lay down a philosophy of fear in rough form for the investigation of the relationship between fear and education. This demanded at a minimum, a transdisciplinary postmodern perspective. The one outcome of that study of the literature was to contrast the preponderant and troubling cultural trope of education without fear I was picking up all over the new education discourses, especially driven by the emphasis of the parents, teachers, and policymakers to try to protect kids, schools, and learning spaces from fear, AAK, the fear of violence, mass murders, failure, judgments, and vast cocktail of other things thought to cause harm to children and youth. In that paper, 2001, I proposed, sorry, 2003, I, con I proposed a contrapositioning to an education without fear setting alternative as less propaganda and more educative, and I called it proper fear of education. Sorry, proper fear education. My aim then and still now is better to keep fear in the picture of schooling and learning generally, because then we can demand as citizens, educators, and philosophers that we better have a proper appropriate fear education rather than trying to always clear fear out of the classroom, out of our minds and bodies. Sadly, post-traumatic effects, like several mass school murders, has left an entire generation of youth shouting out, this is a familiar phrase you may have heard, fear has no place. This is in schools or other places, not the right direction to go for the 21st century of fear management design and plan. I have discussed that latter exacerbation of education without fear in terms of fearism and adultism, whereby the traumatized youth are absorbing their parents' and teachers' fears and terrors, and they cannot imagine a new paradigm like fearlessness. In their despair, all they want is no place for fear. Later, I unfold Barbara Stengel's philosophy of education and teaching without fear, that's her term, in quite a different motivational template and with a much greater possibility of emancipation than the above movement of these youth. If the late Toni Morrison, African-American Pulitzer Prize winning novelist has still wisdom to offer this post-traumatic school generation of youth, it would be amongst other things to advise them the best way to deal with hell is to quote, make a place for fear as she uttered emphatically in her best works. My own similar gesture counter hegemonic is not well received in the education circles of researchers, teachers, conferences, journal editors and reviewers and so forth. Educational philosophers and theorists have been cool to say the least toward it too. It feels like I was and still transgressing some taboo. My version of fear in education is a hard sell. Part of the barrier was the growing wave of toxic positivity culture that has invaded much of Western society and education. I wish someday to write an exhaustive treatise on all the problems with the ways educators, philosophers, and others have brought fear and education together in their diverse and at times contradictory discourses. I heartily agree fear dash and dash education belong in me intimately together and ought not ever be separated in analyses and prescriptions that follow. Educational reformers rarely take up the topic with systematic clarity and critique. Many might disagree with my juxtapositioning here, but at least herein, I have argued, they are definitely an interesting and legitimate pair of phenomena and concerns, which are critical to understanding the fear problematique. My survey of much of the literature on this pair tells me there is a good deal of confused prescriptions as to how humanity is supposed to think about fear in education. I have labeled this problem, this the problem of, Fear management education. Uh, I put management slash education or FME. 
This fear in education literature only rarely with some self-critique acknowledges that recognizing and knowing fear is actually a problem itself. Paying attention to fear as central to human concerns and learning is often ignored its due consideration. It is an excellent cross-disciplinary review in 2010 on fear in education by Carolyn Jackson. Uh, she's quite new discovered by me, um, Carolyn Jackson. Several important claims are summarized, which I highly support as pivotal, if still partial critiques. She writes, Fear is an ill-defined and slippery concept. As frequently occurs with everyday terms, definitions of fear are often absent in social science research, perhaps because of assumptions that everybody knows what it is and or because it is difficult to define precisely. Fear is powerful and pervasive in schools and central to many education discourses. However, a few exceptions it has received very little focused attention in the education literature, despite the increasing interest afforded to it in other disciplines. This is not to say fear has received no attention in education. It has emerged in numerous studies, but in these cases, it seems to be a byproduct rather than focus, she argues. She concludes, furthermore, it is not theorized or discussed other than in passing. Fear has also been explored to some degree by psychologists of education, but the research is narrowly focused, end quote. It's great to find that quote in the, I, I haven't had too many people who say those kind of things that I've been saying for a long time. So it's great to see that published um, by her, Carolyn Jackson. And then I just end with a couple sentences here, you know, I'll leave it for today. The quick two points to emphasize in the above quotes are first, there's no epistemology of fear typically offered in the philosophy of education literature and beyond. So an educational researcher or teacher who wants to investigate the pair of fear in education, they are left hanging without that self-critical reflective grounding in epistemological problematics. Wondering what's on your mind as you think about fear and education as a combination of terms. I look forward to your comments. I look forward to your critiques. Um, whatever you want, just drop it in on the space below on this video. Feel free to pass this on to parents, educators, policymakers, anyone you think in the field of education or philosophy or whatever. Um, I would love to just get a lot more connection, a lot more discussion going. Uh, there's no use me writing books. Why am I here? You know, or that question, the sign I put up. Um, I'm here because I, I want to create dialogue. I want to create conversation to bring about a co-intelligence of the best of our thinking um, that we can do on this topic, fear in education, for example. And my experience has been, unfortunately and sadly, to conclude, um, 33 years of watching what's gone on is most fear researchers, fear writers, um, again, doing the best that they can with what they've got. Um, they are not generally that interested to connect and talk with each other in a sincere, strong way. On that note, and with some optimistic um, prediction with that note, um, Barbara Stengel, Dr. Barbara Stengel at the Vanderbilt University is beginning a conversation with me. Um, she has studied fear and education for quite a long time. I've only recently discovered her work in the last year, less than a year. And uh, she, she's going to be reading some of my book chapters uh, in rough draft, which is, I gave you as a very first rough draft. Uh, I could see a little few problems in there. Are trying to read it. And uh, then she is also in the next year or two when she gets time, she, she will be uh, writing a book on fear, education and the moral life. And I've offered to read her chapters in rough draft. So uh, slowly a little bit is starting to happen with this uh, expanded thinking and really, I think, um, I'm not just going to say progressive, it, it, that isn't even the point. It's It's really just is it, is it good? Is it, is it moving toward a quality of depth of inquiry and in an integral holistic way? And uh, glad to say there's little bits happening. Uh, I'm one of the people who's, you know, 
brought this about. And as I told you, uh, it doesn't come all from my intellectual scholar self. It comes from mystical experiences, artistic self, um, psychological and philosophical self. It comes from this educator self. Um, and it's a lived experience. So I've, anything I write, I, I've had many experiences usually. Um, and some writing to back it up and some writing I do is, is definitely speculative. Okay, lots for today. Thank you very much. Our Michael Fisher signing off.